and I call on the Cabinet Secretary, Michael Matheson. Thank you, President Officer, and I welcome the opportunity to consider the Stage 1 report for the Transport Scotland Bill. This bill is an ambitious and broad piece of legislation covering a wide range of issues. It aims to help develop a cleaner, smarter and more accessible system for the travelling public across Scotland. The bill will empower local transport authorities and others to help improve journeys for the travelling public. Members who monitor the, have monitored the progress of this bill will know it is wide ranging and, wide -ranging and aspirational but also quite technical and complex in areas. Such a mix it can make scrutiny challenging. So I would like to begin, President Officer, by commending the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee for the diligent way it has undertaken Stage 1 consideration. The extensive range of voices and viewpoints the Committee has heard from across Civic Scotland is testament to it accommodating and its meticulous approach to this matter. I welcome the Lead Committee's support for the general principles of the Bill and its recommendation to Parliament that it should agree to the general principles of it. I also look forward to saying more during the course of today's debate about the Government's thinking on some of the matters raised within the report. Sign officer, the Bill's provisions range from measures to improve bus patronage, including smart ticketing, to improving air quality in our cities, increasing the safety and efficiency of roadworks and addressing parking issues. It also makes some necessary technical improvements to quite specific areas, for example, ensuring more appropriate financial flexibility and governance arrangements for some public bodies. In developing the bill, a collaborative approach has been taken so that its measures are informed by those they will affect. And we fully intend this feature of engagement to continue as we develop associated regulations. Now, more widely, it is crucial that we see the bigger picture and how the bill fits into that. This legislation is part of a broader transport jigsaw and must be viewed in that wider context. Whilst matters such as low emission zones, uh, an improved framework for our bus services and prohibitions on irresponsible parking will benefit many, they should not be seen in isolation. In addition to this bill, there is a host of other non-legislative work going on across my portfolio to drive improvement, not least the review of the National Transport Strategy. This wide-ranging review has seen extensive public engagement across Scotland. It is forward-looking and will provide the high-level strategic and policy framework within which the measures in the bill will play out. I expect to issue a draft of the new strategy for consultation later this year. We anticipate that this will also set the context for future consideration of legislation beyond the current measures proposed in the Bill. Such a wider strategic perspective is something, is something the Lead Committee has raised in the sphere of low emission zones. We've always been clear that low emission zones have the potential to interact with a host of other transport issues, be that congestion, active travel, the improved feeling of community space, or the uptake of ultra-low emission vehicles. It is in that vein that local authorities should be looking to implement them. And the Scottish Government is aiding them in this, not least in the strategic context that I've just mentioned. Future LEZ guidance will also help set the measures that in that context. And while we are taking other practical action to make our transport system cleaner, greener and healthier and to improve air quality. I'm therefore pleased that we seem to have quite wide political support for the principles of LEZs. Hopefully there has been, hopefully there has been some fruitful discussions during stage one about specifics that will be set in subsequent regulations. This has covered such issues as penalty levels, the national emission standards and the exemptions. Such feedback builds on the extensive engagement the government is having on these issues, running in tandem with the bill's progression. There have also been questions as to whether specifics on such issues should be set out on the face of the bill. 
Jane Officer, it is worth remembering that LEZs are a new provision in Scotland. Therefore, the flexibility afforded by secondary legislation is necessary. It allows proper engagement on development of the detail and an ability to respond to technological changes. I will, of course, reflect carefully on the comments made by the Lead Committee and the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee, committee to ensure there is appropriate parliamentary scrutiny of these very specific measures. In terms of improving air quality, bus, buses are a part of the solution. So let me now turn to the bus provisions within the bill. Measures to incentivise bus services should be an intrinsic part of those wider proposals around modal shift in LEZ areas and beyond. And the bill offers an ambitious new model for bus provision. The trend of declining bus patronage threatens networks across the country, and we have to work together in order to address this. However, the trend varies across Scotland, as do the causes. So I'm clear that a one-size-fits-all approach will not work. The bill gives local authorities options to improve bus services in their areas, ensuring that they are sustainable bus networks across Scotland. It will support them to meet local needs, whether they wish to pursue partnership working, local franchising, or running their own buses in certain circumstances. On the last issue, I am aware that there have been calls for us to widen our proposal for local authorities to run commercially competitive services themselves. As I've previously stated, I will continue to listen to views on this issue as we move towards stage two. Additionally, the bill will provide the information on bus provide improved information on bus services available to passengers, helping them to pl plan their journeys. This is something that we know people want, and it will make bus travel more accessible and attractive. I will give way to Mr. Rumbles. Mike Rumbles. I, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for giving way. It would be helpful, perhaps, if you could. I'm, I'm pleased he's going to willing to look at this issue. But could he outline what he thinks the objections are to local authorities running commercially? profitable routes. Cabinet Secretary. Absolutely not. So the member will be aware that there are, uh, there are concerns within the bus industry in itself about the commercial viability of some routes and the potential impact that it could have on existing uh, bus operators. But as I've said, um, I'm open to considering uh, further measures that could help to improve bus services at a local level, including the very issue which the member has raised and has been highlighted by uh, the committee. General Officer, as well as uh, providing clearer information about bus services, passengers expect a simple ticketing offer. For smart ticketing, this bill will help exhilarate its implementation. It supports local authorities and operators to go further and faster in terms of delivering multimodal smart ticketing arrangements, underpinned by consistent national standards. The government is clear that partnership working between authorities and operators to address local ticketing needs is the most effective approach in a deregulated bus market. And I'm aware there was support for this approach from various witnesses before the League Committee at Stage 1. Turning now to the parking provisions, I'm sure we all want to make sure that our pavements and roads are accessible for all, particularly those with mobility considerations. So therefore, welcome that there appears to be cross-party support for the principle of pavement and double parking prohibitions in the bill. There have been some debate over the course of stage one about specifics such as the process for exempting streets and exemption criteria for delivery vehicles. This government has aimed to seek to strike a sensible balance on such details. We are still listening to views coming forward and I'm sure we will hear more of that this afternoon. I'll give way to uh, Mr Mason. John Mason. Yeah, I thank him very much for uh, giving way. I mean, would you accept that there are actually quite a lot of streets in the cities where there just is not enough room for all we would like to do? And if the pavements are fairly wide and the roads are fairly narrow, it actually does make sense for cars to park with two wheels on the pavement. Cabinet Secretary. Absolutely, officer, I do recognise that. There are some, uh, particularly in some of our cities, where the streets are too narrow. Uh, for vehicles, both for vehicles on both sides of the road 
uh, and able to park and to allow other vehicles to be able to pass through those areas. That's why the provisions within the bill have been set in such a way as to allow local authorities uh, to be able to exempt particular areas uh, from the prohibition which will be set within the bill uh, in order to give recognition uh, to that particular uh, problem. So, you know, I'm more than happy to give way to Sandra White. Sandra White. Thank you. On that very subject, I, I'm very aware of that. But I would ask, I, I'm going to speak on that subject. I, I would ask that if exemptions are going to be made by local authorities, would they be able to consult or in the bill, would they consult with the local communities there to see, to come to an agreement which is best for both? Cabinet Secretary. Sign officer, there is a provision uh, for local authorities to undertake this process, which would include in consulting with local communities on these matters and also other uh, 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 important partners. So, for example, emergency services who would have a clear interest uh, in these matters to ensure that they're able to express their views um, on uh, these types of, that type of uh, exemption process. Mr. Officer, I'm also grateful to the League Committee's reflections that our provisions on roadworks will provide a positive framework and improve quality, safety and performance. Likewise, uh, for its endorsement of our proposal to give regional transport partnerships more flexibility. On the issue of canals, uh, the Scottish Government has set out in a response to the Committee's report the wider measures we are taking forward to improve such waterways in addition to the provisions that are contained within this Bill. On workplace parking levies, uh, these are not currently in the Bill but have attracted significant interest in recent weeks. The Government has given a commitment to support an agreed Green Party amendment at Stage 2 to create a discretionary power for local authorities to introduce these should they wish to do so. Their support here is contingent on the exclusion of hospitals and NHS premises. This will, President Officer, be a local levy and it will be a matter for local authorities to decide where they wish to consider introducing it in their areas in the future. There, has been, there will be no pressure from the Scottish Government to do so. The Scottish Government recognises that the League Committee will wish to give itself adequate time at Stage 2 to scrutinise such an amendment, including by taking evidence from stakeholders. And we, of course, will support the Committee in whichever way we can to accommodate that requirement. General Officer, the fact that I've cantered through a range of topics in these opening remarks just highlights the multitude of areas that this legislation touches upon. However, I look forward to hearing the views of members across the Chamber this afternoon, and I would call upon the Chamber to support the general principles of a Transport Scotland Bill this evening. Thank you. And I call on Edward Mountain to open on behalf of the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee. Edward Mountain. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm pleased to be able to contribute to this debate in my capacity as convener of the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee. The committee's stage one report on the Transport Scotland Bill was published on the 7th of March, and I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his letter of the 1st of April, in which he provided the Scottish Government's response to these recommendations. In the very limited time available, I will be only able to cover a brief selection of the issues raised by the committee in its report. It's unfortunate we have less time available to debate the wide range of detailed and very complex transport issues covered in the bill than we had to discuss the South of Scotland Enterprise Bill last week, a single issue bill on which there was broad support across the chamber. At the outset, I should say that the committee is aware that the Scottish Government has announced, as it has reaffirmed today, that it is to support a Scottish Green Party amendment at stage two of the bill. This amendment on the granting of powers for local authorities to introduce a working place parking levy. The committee has agreed a timetable for stage two consideration, which we believe will allow us to take oral evidence on the amendment once the actual amendment containing the full details is lodged. However, for the purposes of this debate, I think it's right that, if you'll excuse the pun, we part this issue and discuss the many issues that appear on the bill as drafted. Moving on to the committee's consideration of the bill, I'd like to take the opportunity to thank all those who gave up their time to give evidence at committee meetings and to attend conference calls and to those who attended an evening committee event here in the parliament and those of the many, sorry, that submitted written submissions to the committee. I'd also like to take the opportunity to thank the clerks who supported the committee 
with professionalism at a time of a very heavy workload and a short shortage of team members. I'd like to look specifically to the proposals in the bill and firstly to look at low emission zones. The committee is of the view that the effective introduction of low emission zones will re require steps to be taken in advance to pro provide improvements in public transport provision and to put in place measures such as park and ride facilities and improved active travel opportunities. In its response, the Scottish Government has indicated that it agrees with the committee on this point and that such issues will be addressed in the LEZ guidance. This, we believe, is to be welcome. The introduction of LEZ must be part of a coordinated package of measures if the behavioural change that is required is to be achieved. I also welcome the Cabinet Secretary's agreement of the committee's recommendation that there will be a national consistent emission standards and exemptions set out in the regulations. I note that emission standards are likely to be Euro 6 for diesel and Euro uh, class 4 for petrol. I also note that the Scottish Government agrees with the committee that nationally consistent signage should be used for all LEZs. Finally on LEZs, the committee acknowledges in its report the financial burden that might be faced by businesses and individual motorists should they need to upgrade or replace vehicles to meet the necessary emission standards. It noted in particular this would be likely to present a particularly challenge, challenge to those on lower incomes. I note that the Scottish Government will create a low emission zone support fund that will target those commercial and private vehicle owners who will have the most difficulty in making the transition to LEZ compliant vehicles. This is welcomed and in my view a necessary step if we are to incentivise road users to comply with LEZs. Turning to bus services, in its report the committee acknowledged the widespread concern with the decline in bus use across Scotland. However, the committee notes the concerns expressed by several stakeholders in evidence that the bus service provisions in the bill are unlikely to make a marked difference in stopping the decline in bus use. The committee is concerned that whilst many of these provisions are broadly considered to be positive steps, the reality may be that few of them will be taken up in practice due to the lack of financial resources to facilitate their setup and operation. The Scottish Government clearly disagrees with this view, and whilst I can understand that it wants to remain positive about the proposals in the bill, the broad message the committee received from local authorities and others that, that, there was un, that these proposals were underwhelming and unlikely to deliver any significant improvement. I'm sure that other committee members will comment further on the bus services provision later in the date. On smart ticketing, the committee is concerned that the provisions in the bill to introduce a smart national start, sorry, to introduce a national smart ticketing standards lack ambition and that an opportunity has been missed to deliver a meaningful step change in integrated public transport provision in Scotland. Based on the evidence it heard, the committee is of the view that this can only be achieved through the introduction of a single ticketing scheme operating across all modes of transport. Now, the Scottish Government has responded very robustly on this issue, effectively ruling it out on the grounds of cost and an assertion that this would require a restructuring of the bus market. However, what was made clear to the committee was that progress in this area amongst transport operators has been painfully slow. It remains to be seen if passed, the proposals in the bill will result in any tangible progress being made. Turning to pavement and double parking. Whilst the committee welcomes the proposals in the bill to prohibit pavement and double parking, it expressed concerns that the appropriateness of the exemption which will allow a 20 minutes for loading and unloading of deliveries. Therefore, called on the Scottish Government to bring forward an amendment at stage two to remove the exemption and for a more appropriate and workable mechanism to be de developed and included in guidance. However, the government has said that it considers that removing the exemption would enable loading and unloading for an unspecified and unlimited length of time. This technically may be the case, but it does not respond to the committee's concerns that the exemption proposals as drafted would present innumerable practical and enforcement difficulties. 
And I would urge the Cabinet Secretary to rethink this, on, uh, rethink this position on, the, on this matter before Stage 2. On dropped curbs, during the Stage 1 scrutiny, the Committee discussed the issue of parking across dropped curbs at pedestrian and other recognised crossing places. It felt that this was a significant barrier to the accessibility of urban streets. The committee therefore called on the Scottish Government to bring forward an amendment at stage two to prohibit this practice. It is encouraging that the Scottish Government is currently considering the most appropriate legislative route for addressing this issue. However, I would urge it to accelerate its considerations and bring forward a suitable amendment in this bill to complete what would be a very welcome package of parking prohibitions which would comprehensively enhance accessibility in urban areas. Presiding officer, in the time available, I've only been able to skim the surface of the many issues covered in the committee's stage one report. I hope that my fellow committee members will take the opportunity to discuss further elements of the report when they make their contributions. But in conclusion, the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee recommends that the general principles of the Transport Scotland Bill be agreed to. However, we look forward to stage two and consider considering the many proposals that are made to, for its improvement. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I now call on Jamie Green. Thank you, presiding officer. It's a pleasure to open the stage one debate on behalf of the Scottish Conservatives. And can I also add my thanks to the clerks my fellow committee members, many of them are here today, but also the many stakeholders that I've met over the last few months who've shared their views and opinions on the bill. And that also includes the Transport Secretary and his team who have been very helpful in, in those discussions. Uh, since the Transport Scotland Act of 2005 was passed, more people now own and operate cars. Our buses have seen decreases in patronage and the emergence of the gig economy has changed our driving habits and indeed our economy. But equally so, since 2005, there has been a renewed focus on our domestic and international obligations to tackle climate change. So from the outset, these benches will be supporting the bill at stage one. We agree with the general principles of what the bill is trying to achieve. Although in many ways, presiding officer, we do not think the bill goes far enough to tackle many of the overarching issues which we think faces Scotland's transport networks. So if you're watching this debate and hoping to hear us discuss a groundbreaking flagship piece of legislation which the government has brought forward which will transform how Scotland is connected or how uh, it will radically address shortcomings in rail, road, bus, marine or indeed aviation or how this parliament intends to revolutionise how we transport goods, people or produce or you're welcome to stay tuned but you equally may wish to change channels. This bill overall tinkers with existing legislation and proposes fairly benign new powers as it's currently drafted. It's all very necessary, perhaps, but it doesn't exactly push the limits of policy imagination. There's little on the long-term plans to improve community travel and transport, uh, particularly amongst uh, our elderly populations in rural communities. There's little that develops sustainable, non-concessionary travel, travel frameworks, or anything that proposes to deliver dramatic improvements to our railways, our ferries, or a radical overhaul of the state of Scotland's roads. That all being said, and to be constructive, let me address my own thoughts on this bill. Part one, low emission zones. Now, we think air quality remains an issue in our cities. It lowers life expectancy and it puts huge pressures on our health service. In that respect, we agree there is a need for low emission zones. However, there are significant issues that have been raised with the current proposal. The committee took evidence on this and in private consultations I've had with stakeholders, a number of people are rightfully concerned, not least those who will be least likely to afford to have to upgrade to new Euro 6 compliant diesel cars. Not least those small businesses who use vans, which are often purchased rather than leased, who need them to go about their business. And not least those who live outside of the cities in rural Scotland, who do often drive diesel cars or agricultural vehicles, and they often sweat their assets much longer than those in cities. And what about those who find, they will, uh, find themselves living within a zone and will be penalised simply for going about their everyday business, taking the kids to school, commuting to work? If public transport was universally perfect, there would be no need for a car. 
And in, in an ideal world, there would be no need for a low emission zone. But we live in the real world. Businesses are concerned and we ought to listen to them. Industries such as the bus and taxi industries have raised concerns over the costs of operating within the zones and the costs of purchasing compliant vehicles. An electric powered taxi costs 60,000 pounds. The committee stage one report made explicit reference to this. It says, LEZ should not be introduced unless appropriate steps are taken in advance to provide improvements in public transport and to put in place measures such as park and ride and improve active travel opportunities. I agree, but that is not what is in the bill. So these benches want to see some clarity over national standards. Yes, let's leave the geography and the operating hours at a local level, but let's avoid confusion for business by having multiple and distinct schemes with conflicting standards. We'd like to see a clear timetable for introduction of the schemes with phased implementation, which gives everybody time to plan and transition to the new world. We would like to see appropriate incentives to take up and encourage use of ultra low emission ve vehicles or low emission zone compliant vehicles. And let's have a proper look at exemptions. Is it wise that the disabled, blue badge holders or unavoidable travelers will have to pay to make vital journeys into our cities for health appointments or indeed to tackle social isolation? Support for residents residing within zones. Let's enhance public transport opportunities within zones. And we may be seeking to lodge amendments to that effect. Starting also other areas outside of low emission zones have not gained as much media attention uh, as this bill has progressed, but they are important nonetheless. The first is local bus franchising. Now, I, I think there is a, a role for local bus franchising. Uh, I, I don't think it's a decision that should be made by anyone but local authorities. They are the ones, after all, who will have to be transparent and open to their local taxpayers about how that money is spent. But I do share concerns that the current provisions in the bill uh, only allow them to operate where there's an unmet need. I think that is severely limiting, and I'm pleased to hear the Cabinet Secretary address that in his opening remarks. But the reality is, how many local authorities really have the money to set up depots, to lease buses, to hire drivers, and pay the pension pots? And even if they did have the money to do that, what happens when a commercial operator comes along and says, I want to operate on that route too? There are so many unanswered questions as the bill is drafted, but the main one is, does the bill go far enough in this respect? Uh, on some other issues that the bill addresses, such as smart ticketing, I think there are some good initiatives here. Uh, the issue around uh, standardization of technical standards is uh, a wise thing to do, but really it falls dramatically short of introducing what I think we should have, which is a fully interconnected ticketing network, the likes of which so many other countries benefit from. And in short, I'm afraid, I think the government has really missed a trick here. On the issue of roadworks, well, there's not much to disagree with, but we heed the committee's warnings that local authority finance uh, and resource remains a significant barrier to ensuring compliance. One of the contentious issues that has arisen is that of double pavement, a uh, double in pavement parking. Uh, pavement parking is an issue in Scotland, we know that. It, it affects those who use our pavements, people with disabilities, people with push chairs, in wheelchairs, the visually impaired, and they're struggling to get past cars who've parked inappropriately. But equally, uh, it is also a, a widespread practice, which as John Mason alluded to, is a, a necessity on so many roads. We haven't talked enough about the issue of displacement. If you move these cars off the pavement and onto the road, where do they go? Now I hear that there will be powers for local authorities uh, to uh, exempt roads, but how many have done the mapping exercise that they need to do? How much time do they have to do that? And how much resource do they have to do that? I don't think the top-down approach that this bill is taking is the right way. I, uh, I have very limited time, I'm sorry. Um, I, have, I think the best way to do this is to empower local authorities to ban the practice where uh, it needs to be uh, stopped. It is all about empowering local authorities who know their streets and their communities best. And I don't think this top-down approach is the right one. And my closing seconds, presiding officer, it's a shame we didn't have more time to debate this bill, but I need to talk about the workforce parking levy. It would be remiss of me not to. I vociferously campaigned that this amendment should have been brought into the bill at stage one, so that evidence could have been taken and it could have been added to the stage one report. The view from these benches is very simple. This is an ill thought through regressive tax on Scotland's workforce and we will oppose it at every stage of the proceedings.
I won't. Presiding officer, there's a lot to be positive about in this bill. There is a lot to be positive about in this bill, and we will, we will approach it constructively in terms of amendments. But there are areas which need improvement. The stage one report was robust and in-depth. I look forward to progressing this bill through Parliament and to taking a constructive uh, part in future debates on it. And I look with great interest to hear comments made today. Thank you. Thank you. And I call on Colin Smith to open for the Labour Party to be followed by John Finney. Thank you, President Officer. Imagine a transport system where our transport agencies had the powers to, to properly regulate public transport in their area and deliver a genuinely integrated transport system. Imagine a transport system where local communities could establish their own municipal bus companies without restrictions, so passengers, not profits, were put first, and any surpluses were reinvested in better bus services, not shareholders' dividends. Or imagine a, a transport system where you could board a bus, use your bank card to, to buy a ticket for that bus and the connecting train, and no matter how many times you made that journey that week, it would calculate the cheapest fare for you. Besides, obviously, you can imagine all these things, but this transport bill won't deliver any of them. It's a bill whose timidness is matched only by the Scottish Government's response to the REC Committee Stage 1 report. So I welcome the fact that the Cabinet Secretary made clear in his opening comments that that response is just the start of the Government's thinking on changes and not their final word. That Stage 1 report captured a range of views across many stakeholders, and their views deserve to be properly considered as this bill passes through Parliament. Now, there are aspects of the bill uh, that exist that I welcome, and I'm glad the Scottish Government have, for example, set out a legislative framework for low emission zones. They proposed a ban on pavement and double parking. They've increased the powers of the Roadworks Commissioner, and after opposing not one but two Labour members' bills on the subject, the bill plans to introduce some element of regulation to our bus network. But on too many accounts, the bill lacks ambition. The mandatory minimum grace period for LEZs and the length of the maximum period, along with the lack of a clear definition of an LEZ, could actually end up slowing down the change needed to tackle air pollution. The loopholes in the ban on pavement parking, such as allowing 20 minutes for delivery and loading risk undermining the aims entirely. And on buses, the bill tinkers around the edges of a failed deregulated system where our bus network is being dismantled route by route across Scotland. Since the SNP came to power, the number of bus journeys in Scotland has fallen by 20%, while bus fares have risen by 17% in real terms. There are many reasons for that decline, changing work patterns and growing congestion, but decisions made by this government have contributed. The bus service operator grant has been reduced by 28% under the SNP. There's been an overall... Oh, I'll take an intervention from Mr Stevenson, yeah. Stuart Stevenson. Um, the member describes uh, falling patronage, etc., etc. Uh, can the uh, member give us the equivalent numbers for Welsh government uh, bus patronage and support where Labour are in power? Colin Smith. I can, t I I can tell Mr Stevenson that the equivalent, fall, the equivalent fall in the last few years in Scotland has been 8%. In the rest of the UK, it's been 5%, it has to be said. However, I have to also say, and the important point is, that this bill will do nothing, nothing whatsoever to reverse that decline, a point that Mr Stevenson agrees with because it's in the REC committee report that he agreed to. Now, one of the other contributing factors, of course, to the, the fall in bus usage, of course, has been the cuts in recent years to council budgets, cuts that are leading to yet more reductions in support for bus services across Scotland. And as I said, this bill will do nothing to reverse the decline in bus passengers' numbers. It will do nothing to drive up standards in the sector, strengthen passenger rights or workers' terms and conditions. It won't improve affordability or tackle transport poverty. It will not properly promote community transport. And crucially, it will not lift the ban introduced by Margaret Thatcher, preventing local authorities from competing to run bus services. The limited measures on franchising and partnership are welcome, but we need radical changes to the way buses are run in Scotland to protect the lifeline services currently being axed and to stop the big bus companies simply cherry picking the most profitable routes. That means allowing our local councils to set up and run local bus companies to meet their community needs without the restrictions the bill places on them. It means ensuring that when changes to bus routes are proposed, they will only be allowed after proper consultation with passengers and agreement by the Traffic Commissioner. It means putting a stop to the race to the bottom in the way staff are treated. If a company wants to receive public money for delivering services, they should be paying their workers a decent wage and delivering proper terms and conditions. It means ending rip-off fares, not just setting up an advisory board 
on smart ticketing, but given that board a legally binding remit to actually deliver a single ticketing scheme across Scotland and across transport modes. And it means properly investing in our buses, not imposing a £230 million real term cut in the local council budgets needed to make that investment as the government's recent budget does. Because, President Officer, if you believe, as Labour does, that public transport is a public service, and if you really want to improve our environment, then you need to properly fund that public transport. However, what won't protect our environment are the proposals for a so-called workplace parking levy, in particular one that's an afterthought being introduced at stage two of the bill. I'll give an intervention John to Finney. Mr Finney. Yeah, I'm very grateful for the member taking an intervention on that point. Was that his position when his councillor colleagues in both Glasgow and Edinburgh had it as part of their local authority manifestos? Colin Smith. Well, one of the deep concerns I've got about this proposal and why this parliament needs to make a decision first is because under, no, but under these proposals, if a car parking tax was introduced by Edinburgh, which Mr Finney is suggesting, thousands of workers, my constituents living in Midlothian, the Borders, South Lanarkshire, Dumfries and Galloway, many on low incomes, priced out of the housing market in Edinburgh, even if they wanted to live there, would have to pay this tax because they have no choice but to use their car to get to work. Yet they, yet they, yet they and their local councillors won't actually have a say on whether or not that tax is introduced in Edinburgh and not a penny raised and not a penny raised and not a penny raised will be spent on public transport in Midlothian or the south of Scotland. That's a point and a flaw in Mr Finney's proposals when eventually we get to actually see those proposals that are currently being hidden from us by this government. Now, this, this budget deal that's been done will mean that someone on £124,000 a year is getting a cut in their income tax at the same time as our aggressive car parking tax is being introduced, but a company boss will pay the same as a company cleaner and where the chief executive of a health board on over £100,000 a year will be exempt but a carer working in a hospice on the living wage will have to stump up their, 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 their figures. So no wonder, and I'll quote the trade unions here, and Mr Finney may want to listen to the trade unions, no wonder unison say it devalues council workers and other staff who deliver vital services. No wonder the GMB say it's an attack on the take home pay of workers. No wonder Unite say it's a desperate attempt to absolve the government from the funding crisis they've presided over. And no wonder Aslef say it's a burden on workers. So I make no apologies for being on the side of workers in this debate because they're being forgotten by the SNP and Greens. So presiding officer, Labour will oppose the workplace packing levy, which is simply allowing the rich to pay to pollute. And in support on the principles of the bill today, we serve notice that we plan to bring forward a series of amendments to improve the bill, some of which I'll cover in my closing speech at the end of the debate. So I hope that when we do bring forward those amendments, the government will move beyond the response to the REC Committee Stage 1 report and work across Parliament to make the very significant improvements that this bill needs. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I now call on John Finney to open for the Green Party. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Uh, President Officer, and like colleagues, I'd like to thank uh, the people who have contributed to this, uh, our witnesses, uh, our, our, our staff, and indeed uh, the many organisations who have provided uh, briefings for this bill, um, which at decision time the Scottish Green Party will support. A transport bill should be seen as an opportunity, um, should be viewed as a, a longer term vision, bring about policy coherence, uh, not just within the transport portfolio, but across the transport portfolio. And, and I have to say, I See, get no sense of crusading in the part of the Scottish Government with us. The Cabinet Secretary did say that it was aspirational and he talked about a transport jigsaw. I have to say I prefer the approach of people like the Poverty Alliance in Oxfam who posed the question, what would an ideal transport system look like? Well, while some of the provisions in this would clearly contribute towards a, a, an ideal transport system, we're way short of that. This is a piecemeal bill. Um, bill. It's conservative in outlook and will be amended. Now, Again, the, the, uh, trans uh, the Cabinet Secretary referred to a national transport strategy, and uh, th that's to be welcomed. And uh, I look forward to seeing that, and I'm sure there'll be a lot of interesting contributions. Uh, transport Scotland, uh, uh, Transform Scotland, I beg your pardon, in their uh, submission talk about that, and the opportunity there are to address issues like, for instance, congestion, which I think all my colleagues acknowledge are, are an issue. But of course, what doesn't affect congestion is the means of propulsion of a vehicle. So everyone's enthusiasm to replace diesel, well, originally petrol with diesel and now diesel with electricity or, uh, is, is not the answer. What the Scottish governments uh, uh, do, do say in their documents that support this bill is that transport is a key facilitator in societal improvement and cohesion. 
I want to say the bill will have a positive impact in the Scottish Government's purpose to create a more successful country. I think that's a significant leap on the basis of what we have in front of us. Because far too many of the policies, transport policies, are about reinforcing the status quo. The market still prevails in this bill as regards bus transport. Um, um, it will be private profit and, and public penalty. And as much as what we know is that local authorities, hard pressed local authorities, will be able to pick up the scraps, the scraps. Uh, road building is the priority of the Scottish Government and indeed the other parties uh, and it's just part of the ongoing concession that there is to the motoring lobby. And of course if you do that you ignore the needs of 30% of households who don't own a motor car. Um, what we do know and we do know from the policy memorandum the Scottish Government's own facts and figures that buses contribute about 5% of uh, road transport emissions, cars contribute 60%. And we also know that three quarters of public transport journeys in Scotland are undertaken by buses. And much is made of Lothian buses and uh, delighted that they now have their 100 seat buses on the go. Um, it's publicly owned and run. The beneficiaries of Lothian buses are the residents in uh, the city of Edinburgh and surrounding areas. Um, and buses, of course, are vital for people going to the work, to school, to college, to hospital, to shops, to visit friends and family. And as has been said already by other contributors, people are faced with cuts to routes, poor services and fair hikes. And there's decades of decline in patronage. And it would be entirely wrong to lay it all at the door of the, the present government. This has happened since the 60s. And people have alluded to many of the reasons why that is the case. Um, transports, trans, as a very Freudian slip, transform Scotland, uh, quote the key PNG research on decline. And they talk about congestion and its impact on journey times, reliability and costs, the impact of parking lifestyle changes which has been alluded to and of course the relatively low cost of car use um, uh, and so we see declining revenue from government uh, for the bus industry and rising costs now what would help of course is bus priority measures um, and low emission zones and again there's been much a negative talk about low emission zones what there's been little talk of is the 40,000 lives in the UK uh, that are lost directly attributable to poor air quality. And that's not just poor air quality in the, the centres of our major city. I'm constantly reminding residents in the town of Inverness where I live that one of their streets has such poor quality that has to be constantly monitored. Uh, so what the, the idea of encouraging more people to come in clearly doesn't make sense. We know that progressive countries are uh, the uh, countries who are, are seeking to have vibrant town centres where people can live, work and, and enjoy, where the motor car doesn't rule. Now, um, there's a, a danger that we could get uh, bogged down in the workplace car parking levy and discuss uh, hypotheticals, uh, but what, what we have heard already is rank hypocrisy from two of the parties, yeah. two of the parties uh, in relation to this issue. Um, uh, and uh, I, I dare say that that's, that's likely, likely to continue. Um, and <laughs> What we do know, what we do know about bus use in Edinburgh is a very fine model to, to talk about. We do know that Edinburgh bucks the trend in many respects, not just in relation to ownership, not just in relation to innovation, not just in relation to the range of routes and availability, but the nature of the passengers that use Edinburgh buses. Because buses are used by poor people. Cars are used by people who've got money. And that's why we've seen decade after decade of assistance given to the motoring industry. At the expense of the bus industry, what we know in Edinburgh is it's a wide range of people that use the, uh, um, the, the bus network. And again, back to the Poverty Alliance in Oxfam, we talk about the critical low role that transport pays in, in people experiencing poverty in terms of supporting their ability to increase their income uh, and in terms of the significant and important cost that it has. So affordability is another thing that's very important. There are many, many aspects to, to, to the bill that are um, positive. It lacks ambition. Uh, the Scottish Green Party will seek to inject some ambition at stage two. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr Finney. I call Mike Rumbles to open for the Liberal Democrats. Presenting officer, let me state from the outset that I believe that this bill is important and that the Liberal Democrats will be supporting it at decision time later this afternoon. Now, the government does have great intentions with this bill and tries to address some major transport issues from the introduction of low emission zones, to the state of our bus services, to national ticketing arrangements, to the banning of pavement parking. What it so far doesn't do is address the contentious issue of a workplace parking charge, and that, of course, as we've heard, is missing from the bill as it stands. But we are told by the government, oh, let me get, I have 30 seconds, come on. 
and then it will appear at stage two, even if it didn't appear at the important stage one evidence gathering. I'm more than happy to give away, but not just yet. Let me turn to low emission zones first of all. If we are serious about creating effective low emission zones in our cities, then we must ensure that steps are taken before their introduction to improve public transport provision in the areas affected. And while the government agrees with this, it basically says, over to you local authorities. Now we must also ensure that there must be consistency across the country as to which vehicles may enter an LEZ to avoid confusion and encourage compliance with the regulations. And I'm pleased to see that the government accepts this point in their response to the committee's report. I'll learn, now turn to the actions needed in the bill to arrest the general decline in bus use. Um, it, and contrary to what Mr. Finney says, it's not just poor people that use buses. I use buses every day. Uh, lots of people use buses, not just the poor. The bill will be a great opportunity to tackle this issue. Unfortunately, I don't agree with the Cabinet Secretary that on this issue the government has been ambitious with the bill. And I'm, I'm welcome, I agree with John Finney on this point. He said it's not exactly a crusading bill. On the one hand, the government wishes to amend the 85 Act to allow local authorities to set up their own bus services. On the face of it, a very good idea. However, we've got the curious position of the government saying to our local authorities that you can set up your own bus company, but there aren't any more resources available for you to do it. And by the way, you can only run your buses on unprofitable routes. And if these routes become profitable, you'll have to hand them over to the commercial bus companies. Now, what local authority is going to do that? Now, we asked this question in committee, and we're still waiting to find out. Now, I personally can't see any local authority taking up this offer in the bill. So, in our view, this is a missed opportunity. This proposal in the bill looks good, but on detailed examination, to paraphrase someone else, nothing will change. Franchising does seem to me to offer a better way forward. However, I'm not so convinced about the need to have an independent panel to oversee local transport authorities. Local democratic control of this process, it seems to us, is important, and I'm not convinced that our local authorities having this additional hoop to jump through is the right way to go. In the short time left to me, I want to focus on the part of the bill which deals with pavement parking and the yet unseen proposal for a workplace parking charge. A ban on pavement parking in the bill is most welcome. However, I do have real concerns that the government have in section 47, section 6C, exceptions to the parking provisions, provided a real get out clause, actually making it legal for the first time to obstruct the pavement when loading and unloading for a period of 20 minutes. This one provision means in reality that this attempt to ban the obstruction of our pavements will be hopelessly ineffective. Yeah. Jamie Green. Jamie Green. Thank you. Uh, is it therefore uh, the Lib, Lib Dem policy that there should be no exemptions to double parking? And if so, how on earth does it expect to get in and out of taxis? My grumbles. I'm talking about obstructing our pavements. That's what I'm talking about. The committee in our report make it clear that it is concerned that the 20 minutes for loading and unloading deliveries may have the unintended consequence of creating a national exemption for pavement parking by commercial vehicles. That's our concern, Minister. Can you imagine how it would be impossible to enforce the law when vehicles are actually allowed to load and unload like this? This exemption does, in our view, make a mockery of the intention behind this part of the bill, and I urge the government to think again on this proposed exemption. Now, I, yeah, of course. Secretary. Could, could the member just clarify, is his view that there should be no exemption at all or that the 20-minute period is too long a period for the exemption to apply? My numbers. The evidence that we've received in committee is that whatever amount of minutes that you put on there is going to be impossible to, to enforce. At the moment, the law says you can't park, you cannot obstruct the pavements. That's what the law says now. Exactly. However, if the minister wanted to come forward and say that uh, there could be an exemption if a certain amount of space was left on the pavement, then that would be another matter. Now, I want to address the unique situation we are, we are in over the proposed workplace parking levy. We've got a situation where the Scottish Government will whip its MPs, MSPs, to support an amendment to the bill which its MSPs haven't even seen. Indeed, no member, I, I would love to if I had time. I'm afraid there's only about, um, okay. well, no, okay. not, not much time, I'm afraid. 
I, minute maybe tops. You've got a minute left at tops. Okay, I, I'm sorry, I can't. Last minute. It's MSP, and indeed no member of the committee has seen it, and I understand not even a Green MSP has seen it for a Green, a green <laughs> Amendment. So when the committee eventually sees the amendment, no matter what the evidence has presented, the majority of the committee members, that's all the SNP and the Green members, are being told they must vote for it. No matter what the drafting problems that may be found, no matter what the unintended consequences that are found by detailed scrutiny of this legislation, the committee we know it will be voted through. Now, I know that I have a lot of respect for the minister, and I've considered Michael Matheson to be a responsible minister. I don't blame him for this issue. This has been foisted on him. But it's no way to pass legislation. A responsible government wouldn't behave in this way. And I never thought our strong committee system established in 1999 would ever end up being misused like this. Thank you very much. And we enter the open part of the debate. I call Stuart Stevenson to be followed by Peter Chapman. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, and let me start by declaring my uh, honorary presidency of the Scottish Association for Public Transport, which is a keen interest in the uh, topic area before us. Um, I want to just start on essentially where the Labour Party is coming for buses and the desire uh, for probably every council in Scotland to take over the running of bus services, and I want to talk about some of the financial implications of that. I previously talked about the financial implications uh, for the bus pass proposals for under 25s. Uh, these are equally improbable. Uh, firstly, uh, the general principle is if you take away a franchise to do business from a business, you have to compensate that business with one year's revenue. Not one year's profit, one year's revenue. So that's 700 million or 800 million thereabouts straight away. So that's, that's the first thing to do. The next thing is to actually have a look at the accounts of Edinburgh buses, because that gives us some, in, an excellent company, let me immediately say that, uh, and indeed my great uncle Alec uh, was the uh, cabinet holder in the Edinburgh Council 100 years ago, who's responsible for this, so it probably is down to him. Anyway, the, the, the accounts for Lothian buses, what is the capitalization in Lothian buses, which covers about 10% of Scotland's population? And the answer is in the accounts for 31st December 2017, 147 million. Now, if I therefore factor that up, and it's a very crude way to do it, which is capable of criticism, and I accept that, but I have nothing better, then it becomes 1.5 billion pounds, and you add the 700 billion, we're talking 2.2 billion pounds. Now, I accept that is the top ceiling which you almost certainly wouldn't reach and couldn't exceed. But it illustrates that the general point is that there's a lot of numbers to look at and there's been almost no talk about numbers. Um, there is a profit, the dividend comes back, of course there is, but you need the capitalization in, in, in the first place uh, to deal with it. Um, it's also worth saying, of course, they've got to buy some vehicles or buy them from the existing uh, bus companies. I suspect uh, they wouldn't get a huge uh, discount from the existing bus companies who, who, for whom it would, in effect, be a forced sale. So I urge the uh, Labour Party, perfectly entitled to pursue proposals that they pursue, uh, to bring forward some numbers that are based on something more than my, bluntly, about 20 minutes research, just simply picking up the accounts of Lothian Buses, uh, an excellent company, I repeat once again, and I too, from time to time, use them with my bus bus. Now, uh, bus service improvement partnerships and the proposals in the bill, uh, I, I do sup Yes, I will. Colin Smith. The, the member has just effectively slated the idea of local authorities being able to set up bus companies unrestricted. Does he support the government's plan they should be allowed to set up bus companies to only meet unmet need? And exactly how many local authorities do you think are going to do that? Stuart Stevenson. I'm very clear that the government's proposals are good proposals that are worthy of support. We have other proposals coming from the Labour Party, which I do not close my mind to. Let me just say to the member that that is the case. But I do point out to him that to gain support across the Parliament, he will have to provide some numbers of the investment that required, the capitalisation, the liabilities that would be taken on, particularly in relation to pensions, as you two pay across people from the commercial company. 
pennies. And I, I, I urge the member simply to bring numbers forward. Then he may persuade more of us who are yet to be persuaded. The bus improvement partnerships, I, I think it's fair to say that the previous provisions, the voluntary and the compulsory partnerships, have not really delivered, as I think we all hoped in the passage of the, the previous bill. Uh, looking at the new proposals, I know uh, that the bus companies uh, are cautiously supportive of them, and I think that's probably uh, reasonable, uh, and I'm certainly prepared uh, to be cautiously uh, propose, uh, supportive of them as well. Now, let's just talk, uh, uh, oh, uh, one final thing on buses. Um, I think we can do more on bus lanes. We make them all 24 hours a day, and we make them compulsory and we enforce them better. Then you'd get consistent bus journey times and people would rely on buses more. Parking, it's important what we do on parking that we respect the needs of those with mo reduced mobility and in particular with people who are blind, who may walk into vehicles uh, that are parked on uh, pavements that they simply uh, don't see. And dropped curbs are an issue as well because blind people need a very clear delineation between pavement uh, and road. On the subject of loading and unloading, um, I'm, I'm just going to make a sort of rather obvious suggestion that you should only be able to load and unload if you have an indicator on your screen that is adjusted to show the time that you started parking. And that's done in other countries, by the way, so there's nothing particularly uh, novel ab about... I, I'm in my last minute, do forgive me. Um, now, finally, just a little bit on the workplace parking. I, like others, have not seen it, and the whips have not approached me to tell me what I have to say or do on the subject as yet. What I will say to you, however, is there are different ways of introducing this, and I encourage Mr Finney to think about this, that uh, anything that puts a cost on individual citizens, I'm reluctant. Anything that puts this cost on those who have to provide the parking, I might be prepared to support. In other words, if it's a charge on companies, fair enough. If it's a charge on individuals, it's a much more difficult ask uh, for me. Uh, Presiding officer, I think this is an excellent bill that I have no hesitation in saying I will be supporting come decision time tonight. Presiding officer. Thank you, Mr. Stevenson. I call Peter Chapman to be followed by Neil Baby. Mr. Chapman, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And I wanted to open, as my other REC committee colleagues have, by thanking the clerks and everyone who attended the committee during evidence sessions to help write this report. It is clear across this chamber that although we all appreciate what this bill is trying to do, on the whole, it lacks ambition and we will need, it will need to be amended as it proceeds to achieve its aims. However, I agree with the general principles of this bill. Climate change and air quality have been discussed numerous times in this chamber over the past two weeks alone, and these are key drivers of this bill. Now, this is a large bill covering six main aspects relating to transport. Now, time will not allow me to comment on all six, but I will discuss low emission zones and bus services. Part one of the bill creates a legal right for local authorities to establish, operate, amend and revoke low emission zones. Now, this is a key instrument within the bill to reduce congestion and improve air quality in Scotland's four main cities, including, of course, Dundee and Aberdeen in the northeast region, which I represent. A low emission zone would restrict vehicles within the LEZ to those that meet specified emission standards. And anyone who drives a car within an LEZ that does not meet the standard or is exempt will be fined. This bill, however, lacks clarity and needs a clear definition of what an LEZ is and what its obje objectives should be. And it will be necessary for the Scottish Government to bring forward an appropriate amendment at stage two to allow this clarity. Effective introductions of LEZs will require improvements to public transport provision, measures such as park and ride facilities and improved active travel opportunities will need to be put in place. And educating the public of why a zone is important and the benefits it will deliver will be essential, in my opinion, to get drivers to buy into the concept. There must also be a robust appeals process to address queries on penalties and circumstances when drivers require to access the zone in an emergency situation. And to avoid confusion and encourage compliance, there must be consistency across the country as to which vehicles can enter an LEZ. The regulations must clearly set out minimum technical emission standards. 
Standardised signage and a comprehensive package of information must be provided by local authorities at all stages of introduction to allow people to have sufficient time to prepare for the changes. And there will be a cost implication for business and individual motorists should they need to upgrade their vehicles. And as, as is often the case, this will impact most heavily on those on lower incomes. Part two of the bill addresses issues around bus services and focuses on concern about the long-term decline in bus use across Scotland. This decline is being driven by many factors, including the reduction in direct bus support in rural areas and congestion in towns. The lack of appropriate infrastructure, such as bus lanes, is leading to slow average speeds and long and slow journeys. The current provisions in the bill allowing councils to run their own bus services will not, in my opinion, deliver. We heard during evidence sessions that few local authorities are likely to have financial resources or the expertise to take advantage of the options set out in the bill. Indeed, Aberdeenshire Council has just recently axed several services in rural areas due to lack of funding. The bill would amend the 1985 Transport Act to allow a local authority to provide local bus services where this is an unmet public transport need. The committee felt this was too restrictive and recommended an amendment at stage two to allow greater flexibility. I, however, disagreed with this because if councils can get involved where there's, there is already adequate bus provision, they may trigger a bus war with the company already supplying the services and the bus wars, wars in my opinion, never end well. This bill proposes replacing statutory, statutory bus quality partnership with, with, a, with a BSIP, which involves two elements. Now, this change is generally welcomed, but again, local authorities question whether they will be able to take up a partnership due to constraints on time and resources. Further information has thankfully been provided by the Scottish Government, which clears up some of the confusion about how BSIPs will work in practice and how they will differ from the previous scheme. However, this clarity is lacking in the bill as drafted. Another initiative allowed within the bill is bus service franchising. However, in practice, it was felt that only a small number of local authorities would have the time or resources to establish a framework. It is obvious to me that the uptake of many of the various schemes on offer in this bill for bus services will only happen if the government is prepared to put additional funds at the disposal of councils. Other sections of this bill, which I have not had time to discuss, cover smart ticketing schemes, pavement parking, roadworks and canals. And we expect to work with stakeholders during stage two to further amend these sections as appropriate. There is also the workplace parking levy, which is due to be added to the bill at stage two, which will evoke much debate in the committee and which we in the Conservative Conservative Party will oppose. We can never support taxing people to drive to and park at their work. And indeed, it will be interesting to see how Mr. Lyle responds when we discuss this in committee. In closing, presiding officer, this bill has merit, but it is by no means ready to be implemented as legislation. I am committed to working with all committee members at stage two to scrutinize all amendments that will strengthen and improve this bill and provide more guidance to local authorities and reassurance to the public and small business owners. Thank you very much. I call Neil Bibby to be followed by Sandra White. Mr Bibby, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. As the Cabinet Secretary said, this is a wide-ranging bill covering a, a range of distinct policy areas, but I would agree with members that it's not nearly ambitious enough. I want to focus my remarks today on public transport and the sections of the bill relating to how the bus market in this country operates. Because Scotland's bus market is broken as we accept bus services are in decline and the deregulated model has failed. Instead of seeing a competitive market for bus services in which fair paying passengers are in the driving seat, a patchwork of local monopolies has emerged across the country. We know since 2007 the total number of bus journeys is down by 100 million. We also know 64 million vehicle kilometres have been stripped out of our bus network. Meanwhile, fares keep on rising and rising, rising more in Scotland than in the rest of the UK. 
In fact, the relative cost of bus travel has increased more than any other mode of land transport over the last 30 years, more than double the retail prices index. Presiding officer, it is clear that we need radical change. It is also clear that only where bus services are run on different principles do bus operators buck the trend. Higher passenger satisfaction, slower rates of decline, more profit reinvested in the bus network. In London, where the bus market is regulated to a high standard, or right here in Edinburgh, as we've heard, where Lothian Buses is publicly owned and democratically accountable. The Scottish Government say that the purpose of part two of this bill is to ensure that local authorities have viable and flexible options to improve bus services in their areas. If that is to mean anything, then those options must include a realistic route to collective ownership. Local government must have the power to challenge and to replace the broken, failed, deregulated system. Councils and communities must be empowered to form democratically controlled operators and to work with community transport organisations too. That's why Scottish Labour and Cooperative MSPs will seek to amend this bill, to strengthen Scotland's bus laws, to make municipal and common ownership a reality, to promote community transport on the face of the bill, to recognise that bus routes are essentially community assets and that they should be protected as such, and to give passengers and communities who depend on public transport a real say, a people's bus service run for passengers, not profit. President officer, if you want to know why this is so important, let me give you an example from my own region. Changes by Glasgow City Bus will see the 142 Bishop Briggs Circular withdrawn because of a commercial decision taken by a private operator. There has been no consultation or engagement with the community. And I would say to members, the problem here is that there are plenty of hurdles that transport authorities have to jump through to provide a subsidised service, but apparently none for privately owned operators looking to withdraw bus services entirely. The local councillor, Alan Moyer, who is arguing that the service should be retained, tells me that 70% of those costs who you 70% of those who use the life, this Lifeline service are concessionary card holders. The deregulated market gives no regard to the social impact of withdrawing the 142 bus from this community and many others. That's why we have to shift the powers from the owners of big bus companies to our communities, as Colin Smith said. Presiding officer, Labour will seek to ensure that the hurdles to providing subsidised services through local government are not repeated when it comes to municipal ownership. Local authorities should be allowed to run services as a matter of principle, not just in instances of unmet need. That would allow other parts of the country to benefit from the successful Lothians model where profits are reinvested. It would allow local publicly owned bus companies to freely compete for any service or franchise that they may be created in the future too. On bus franchising, I have long supported London-style franchising powers coming to local government in Scotland. I believe those powers should be automatic. But just as the Scottish Government should provide a realistic route to common ownership, it should also provide a realistic route to a London-style system too. On the issue of funding, there have been substantial reforms to the Bus Service uh, Operators Grant in England and Wales. £93 million is now paid directly to Transport for London in the regulated London market. As a nation, Scotland already subsidises the bus industry to the point that 45% of operators' income comes from the public purse. In addition to funding local government fairly, the Scottish Government should review its funding for bus services to ensure the provisions in this section of the bill are viable. Finally, President Officer, every Scottish Labour MSP stood on a manifesto that promised we would make it cheaper and easier to get to work. It is for that reason that we welcome any progress on smart ticketing and integrated public transport. There should be a single multi-mode smart ticketing system that can be used across all modes of public transport in Scotland. It's also because we believe this, that it should be cheaper and easier to get to work that we cannot support a workplace parking levy. As Colin Smith said, a regressive levy that workers cannot avoid, a levy that would hit the low paid hardest. Climate change is one of the great challenges of our time. Vehicle emissions in our city centres are a public health concern. But the solutions do not have to be complicated. We know what the answers are already. What is required is modal shift towards public transport. Lower emission zones must not exist in isolation. Better bus services will not just enhance public transport,
but help us reduce vehicle emissions too. And so, presiding officer, for all these reasons, we must seek to strengthen this bill at stage two to assert the importance of public transport as a public service. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Bibby. I call Sandra White to be followed by Donald Cameron. Ms. White, please. Uh, thank you very much, presiding officer. Uh, presiding officer, I'm not a member of the committee, but have appeared before the committee on a number of occasions in regard to my responsible parking bill. And I want to thank the committee very much for uh, listening to me and obviously the people who gave, came along and gave evidence and for the work that they have done in this bill, not just in that particular issue. It has been, as been mentioned before, uh, very intensive uh, work that has been done on this bill. And the years that we've been pushing for a responsible parking bill or to be brought into a transport bill uh, basically has been about 10 years. So I'm really delighted that I'm here today being able to talk on that particular bill. Uh, and I also want to thank uh, Ross Finney, previous MSP, who about nine years ago first tried to introduce a bill and then Joe Fitzpatrick afterwards who introduced his bill too. And then I took that bill over. And obviously all of the people, uh, the many, 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 at least 20 uh, various charities and organisations who came together under the basically Living Streets in Scotland and the Responsible Parking Alliance. And that took in all lots of disability charities and social care charities as well, who did an enormous amount of work and helped me enormously when I was putting forward uh, my bill. And I must say that that bill at the time had the largest amounts of uh, correspondence uh, back to the consultation. It was one of the, the biggest uh, the correspondence there uh, to look into a bill as well. Now, I've listened to the various uh, arguments that went on, not arguments, but uh, discussions. And I must admit, I do agree with a number of uh, the recommendations from the, the committee, and in particular in regard to the amendment and drop curbs. Fully endorse what the committee has to say. My original bill did bring drop curbs into the bill, not just the uh, parking as well. And I think it's something that desperately needs to be looked at. When we were taking evidence in the first part of the bill, and to give a little bit of history, not just when Ross Finney or Joe Fitzpatrick was putting that forward, we didn't have the powers in this parliament, believe it or not, uh, to put forward anything to do with uh, block curbs, drop curbs, or any sort of a responsible parking. It was not in the Scotland bill at that particular time. For some reason or another, uh, it just didn't come under any form of transport or a bill. And I do thank the Scottish Government, and I believe it was Derek Mackay at the time, uh, who brought it forward and eventually adopted it into this transport bill. So I think that was fantastic, and that came through the Smith Commission as well. So it's been a long, long road to get to this particular point where we can actually look at this properly. And people mention the fact that... Um, fines, etc., etc. but I never uh, envisaged or meant this bill to be punitive in any way. It's got to be more educational, I think, to educate drivers that basically payments are for people, uh, not for cars. And it was more to do with education. So I, I'm looking forward to going to stage two of the bill, and I would hope there would be an educational part in the bill, which would perhaps be, you know, on the TV, whatever it may be, but some form of education that lets people know, drivers and car owners, that this is coming into force and they would be educated upon this. Because I don't want it to be punitive. I don't believe that the, there are a, a number uh, or a huge amount of irresponsible, careless, couldn't care less, selfish drivers out there. I think most of them are very responsible. It's just a matter of educating to the fact that if you're blind, and we, we saw this in evidence, a gentleman who was walking along the street with a stick and happened to tap a car which was parked on the pavement, the white stick broke, and that gentleman was left stranded on that pavement for hours until somebody came along. And it's things like that, even people taking their kids to school or nursery with a pram, a buggy, whatever it may be, have to go on the road. Now that's dangerous and that shouldn't be allowed to happen. People have to come first before cars, as far as I'm concerned. And obviously, the amount of respondents to, uh, you know, the questionnaires that went out, 95% were in agreement with that as well. So payments are for people. We've got roads which are for cars. And I think it's time that people were educated on that particular piece. And that's why I think drop curbs are very important. 
a number of occasions people have came along walking along the pavement then they can't go anywhere else because somebody has parked on that drop curve and these people want to cross the road but they're disabled they're blind they're elderly or they've got kids in prams so it's about being sensible but i do thank the committee for the amount of work as i said that they have put into that and for putting up with some of the evidence that i brought forward and understand about you know basically you know, having to load and unload that was brought forward by you know, the Hauliers Association, they mentioned that as well at one of the committee meetings that I gave evidence to. But there are, there are areas where it says no loading or only loading, etc. So it's the policing of the loading, which I think is really important. If people are getting something delivered, of course they've got to deliver it to that place. If a shop's there, then they've got to get a delivery as well. But it's got to be done sensibly, that you don't have them across the whole pavement. And that's educating them more than anything else. So thank you very much for allowing me to, to speak in this debate, not being a member of the committee, but I certainly look forward to stage two and then stage three and actually having some form of responsible parking where people can actually walk in the pavements. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you very much. I call Donald Cameron to be followed by John Mason. Mr Cameron, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And I'm grateful to be able to contribute to this stage one debate particularly given that many people who live in the highlands and islands see public transport as a lifeline service, not just a, an alternative to other modes of travel. Um, indeed, there are many rural and remote communities that especially rely on robust and timely public transport and infrastructure to carry out daily tasks, to get to work, to attend hospital appointments and connect with friends and family. Whether that's people in our island communities who need a ferry service which runs on time and has enough space and capacity for passengers and vehicles, or good local bus services to connect people to, from rural communities to Scotland's major cities and towns. Strong transport links are plainly good for society and the economy. And as other Scottish Conservative colleagues have commented, we support the general principles of the bill. And as many of my colleagues have intimated, we feel there are a lot of positive elements in the bill, as well as a few missed opportunities. However, in the time available to me, I want to focus on one particular area which I feel the bill could address slightly more, and that is accessible transport and the need of passengers suffering from disability. Accessible transport is vital for many people across Scotland, particularly the elderly and disabled people. But it's also important for other people, including parents, traveling with young children, for example. The experience of travel is important too, from traveling to a station or bus stop, interacting with the surroundings in these areas, purchasing tickets to using various facilities, all of these elements of the travelling experience, in my view, must be viewed through the prism of accessibility. And I want to cover a few of these different areas in greater detail. I had the benefit last year of hosting a roundtable of stakeholders, including the Scottish Accessible Transport Alliance, Bus Users Scotland, and the Mobility and Access Committee for Scotland, at an event here in Parliament that I, that I organised, and uh, the previous Transport Minister, Hamza Youssef, attended, and I would like to place on record my thanks to him for the interest that he showed in this particular issue. Uh, all in all, there are about 20 delegates from a multitude of organisations who had different ideas, considerations and views on how the accessible transport experience in Scotland should look like in the short term and the long term. And it was a very valuable experience, and I had hoped that some of these suggestions might have um, been carried forward. For instance, one issue uh, that arose was the matter of the design of vehicles. And at that round table event, I heard various concerns about step access, the size of disabled buttons on new train stock, restrictive loop systems, and poorly designed access to toilets. And as a result, it may be that at stage two, one of the things that the bill can consider is the issue of vehicle design. Now, the Equality and Human Rights Commission, in its submission to this bill, said that, and I quote, it recommends that disability access is named as a service standard to which all proposed vehicles used are subject to. I note that the REC committee in its own summary of recommendations and conclusions stated, and I quote, the ability to access transport can play a fundamental role in how a person can contribute to and participate in society and ask the Scottish Government to reflect on and respond to these in detail before stage two of the bill. I sincerely hope that the government does listen to and does act upon this because it is clearly crucial that people have confidence 
around this issue going forward. I'm also particularly concerned about this issue from a, a local aspect of the matter, which involved the resignation of someone called Arthur Cowie from the chairmanship of the Scottish Accessible Transport Alliance, and that was over the redesign of trains operating on the West Highland Line. Now, I know Arthur well as we work together in organising the round table that I mentioned earlier, and he's incredibly passionate about accessible transport, and his resignation from that role, uh, I think, should be noted. And in an article in The Scotsman in February, Arthur said this, he said, recent actions by ScotRail and Transport Scotland have made me realise I've been wasting my time over the last 40 years in trying to achieve accessible travel and we've been played for a fool by the transport authorities over this period. And I find that a particularly concerning indictment and I hope that uh, the government listens to those views uh, going forward with respect to the bill. Um, a couple of other points I'd like to make, presiding officer. I'm concerned that uh, the, the issue uh, doesn't address adequately uh, the point about cars uh, parking across dropped curbs, and that's been mentioned by Sandra White and, and others and, and, and Edward Mountain on behalf of the committee. Apart from the obvious issue that parking across dropped curbs can cause for most road users, it is particularly inconsiderate and problematic for many elderly and disabled pedestrians who rely heavily on open dropped curbs. And I welcome the fact that the REC committee report states that a prohibition of parking across such formally recognised crossing points as distinct from residential driveways would provide a package of measures which would more comprehensively enhance accessibility in urban areas. And again, I hope the Scottish Government takes cognizance of this. Conscious of time, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, I would like to conclude by saying again that we support the bill at stage one. We agree there is a need to adopt new practices and ensure that transport meets our environmental commitments and that we have a long-term plan fit for Scotland today and beyond. And we as a party will scrutinise this bill going forward. And as my colleagues who have spoken thus far have suggested, whilst there are areas of the bill that can be improved, we are generally uh, supportive of it. For my part, I hope that greater consideration will be offered to issues around accessibility so that Scotland can indeed lead the way in this crucial area. Ultimately, every individual who uses public transport in Scotland should have the same choice, the same freedom and the same dignity to travel. And I hope that as this bill progresses, we can make that happen. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call John Mason to be followed by James Kelly. Mr. Mason, please. Thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. Uh, in the first place, I should say that I'm more than happy to support this bill. It covers a number of areas, and I will focus my remarks on pavement parking and the workplace parking levy. So to start with pavement parking, there is no question that we do have a problem. Specifically, a car may be fully on a pavement, or so much on the pavement that a wheelchair or pram could not get past. That is obstruction at the moment. The police have the power to enforce that, but in practice, it is seldom enforced. In an ideal world, there would be plenty of space for completely clear pavements, lanes for cycling, space for parking, and still plenty of room for large vehicles to pass on the road itself. Unfortunately, many roads in Glasgow and beyond just do not have space for all of this. My fear is that forcing cars entirely onto the road surface would cause obstructions for public transport, emergency vehicles and others. And I don't think any of us want that. As I said, there certainly is a problem at present. However, there are also many considerate drivers who put two wheels on the pavement in order to neither block the road nor the pavement. In fact, this is sometimes encouraged by council road markings to ensure that the road itself does not become blocked. Therefore, I wonder if some compromise is needed. Perhaps it would be better for the rule to be that at least 1.5 metres of pavement must be left clear of vehicles. That would allow adequate space for wheelchairs and prams, and if the pavement was less than 1.5 metres wide, there would be no vehicle wheels allowed on the pavement at all. That would also have the advantage of being cheaper than proposals in the bill. Although the bill would allow exemptions, I suspect that councils will resist introducing exemptions as widely as they should because of the cost of doing so. I also am concerned that whatever the rules are, they are unlikely to be widely enforced. Uh, let me just finish this point and I'll take it, yes. Experience in Glasgow already shows that much parking on double yellow lines, as well as parking which causes an obstruction, are not enforced, despite these already being against the law. The bill proposes powers for local authorities to enforce the law, and the government says on page 26 of its response that this is a duty. 
However, I fear that this is just not going to happen in practice. Linked to enforcement is the question of whether fines are sufficient for councils to cover their costs, for example, paying wardens. A Sandra White. Member. Sandra White. Thank the member for taking the intervention. That was one of the areas I was going to, to raise about enforcement. But also that my worry is if you make it known that you can park on a pavement, any, anyone can park on a pavement, even just with two wheels, we have large stretches of roads in my constituency, even though we cover the city centre, or I cover the city centre, I would worry that there would be constant cars on these pavements, which means that anyone, even with a pram or a disability, would have a huge amount of area to walk before they could even get off the pavement. And that, that's a worry for me too. So I don't want to encourage people to be parking on pavements at all. John Mason, I'll give you your time back, Mr Mason. Yeah, well, that's very kind, thank you very much. I mean, I, I do accept there's differences in different parts of the cities and that city centre and Hope Street, where I have seen cars parked on double yellow lines and they are not enforced, is slightly different from most, most of my constituency, eh, which is eh, further out. Um, but I just think eh, we're going to have to get a compromise in here somehow. If I can move on to the working, workplace parking levy, the second main topic eh, is what I wanted to talk about. And there certainly are unusual circumstances around this, eh, as eh, Mr Rumble's already referred to, given that it's become part of the budget agreement and we expect to see an amendment at stage two. It is not normal to see such a major new issue appear at stage two of a bill, and I have to say I think it is not ideal. Stage one is the main place where a committee gives a thorough examination to the main features of any bill. And I believe the REC Committee did give that thorough examination for this bill as introduced. I think there was an argument that the committee could have postponed the completion of its report in order to take evidence on the levy. However, it was decided to press ahead with stage one and deal with the amendment as part of the stage two process. In principle, I'm comfortable with a levy that targets directors and other highly paid individuals who have a parking space in the city centre, when they could easily use a train or a bus for commuting to their nine to five job. But I, for one, certainly have a lot of questions about the proposed levy. We do know that it is only going to be enabling legislation and it would then be up to councils whether they wanted it or not. But we do not know what the level of charge would be, whether it applies to the employer or the employee, what exemptions there might be. It has been suggested that NHS hospitals might be exempt. What about care homes, hospices, GP practices, social work, police, factories that are out of town and work shifts? And should it be extended to out-of-town shopping centres so that shoppers would pay to park and so help to protect our town centres? I look forward to seeing the amendment and to taking evidence at committee and hopefully these types of questions will then be clarified. Finally, if I can just touch on buses, clearly this is another issue which has been raised is whether there would be an advantage in commercial bus services being publicly owned. I certainly do regret that Strathclyde was forced to privatise its buses while Lothian was allowed to keep theirs. However, the reality is that when we did have Strathclyde buses and before them Glasgow Corporation Transport and Scottish Motor Traction, I think that's what SMT stood for, and Scottish Bus Group, there were still frequent complaints about bus services. For example, for us in Rutherglen, the complaint was that all the buses ran to Castle Milk and ignored Rutherglen. And the reality is we had evidence that bus usage has been in decline in the west of Scotland since before 1960, long before any privatisation. Therefore, while I am sympathetic to public ownership, I think we have to be wary that that would automatically lead to increased or improved services. The fall in bus usage is complex and linked to a desire for cars and certainly improved train services in the Glasgow area. I think it's something we should be considering. Therefore, in conclusion, I'm more than happy to support the principles of the Transport Bill. It is clear we will be seeing one major amendment and probably a host of other amendments at stage two, and we will have to see what happens then. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call James Kelly to be followed by Richard Lyle. Mr Kelly is the penultimate speaker in the open debate. Mr Kelly. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. It's, it's, it's actually been a, an interesting and wide-ranging debate. You know, people making contributions on ranging from pavement parking to low emission zones, and I think it, it shows you the wide range that's covered by this bill. Um, but I think the, the issue I want to concentrate on is the issue of buses, which is where I think the bill comes up uh, short. There's no doubt in the area that I represent, the Glasgow region, that uh, buses are very much required by uh, commuters. They're required to, to get to work, they're required for social purposes, and also to travel to, to hospitals. And what we've seen in recent years is that 
there's a concentration of power of buses in, in terms of uh, a small number of companies who concentrate on the more profitable routes, particularly around the city centre. And by the time you get out to Rutherglen, which Mr Mason has just mentioned, and then you go further, Canvas Lang, Halfway, uh, and Blantyre, then uh, the routes aren't uh, as, uh, as, as well um, populated by the buses. And in addition to that, another trend I've seen in recent years is bus companies shutting off the routes uh, at the, on, in the off-peak period, you know, particularly in the evening. Uh, and that can be a real problem, particularly for people who are traveling, um, you know, maybe to, to, to visit people in hospital. Um, so I think one of the things to examine is the, in terms of why that is happening, is, is looking at the trends. And one of the astonishing numbers that I came across in preparing for this debate is that back in 2007, there were 487 million uh, bus journeys and that is now reduced by near well, a million, basically, to 388 million. So a million, there are a million less uh, bus journeys than there were 10 years ago. And you can see there's a number of reasons for that. First of all, fares have increased. Uh, these have gone up by 18% in the, the last five years. So it's more expensive for people uh, to travel on the bus. There are actually less buses. There's 10% less in stock and 2% less in staff. So uh, bus companies are uh, contracting in size, both in terms of infrastructure and numbers, and that therefore feeds on into the routes. And that is also contributed to by the, what uh, Colin Smith described in terms of the, the reduction in the bus service o operator grant. And the overall uh, picture in terms of local government funding being reduced um, hasn't helped in terms of being able to subsidise uh, less profitable routes. So what that get, gives a picture of is a you know, decline in the, um, in the use of bus services, but an increase in the power of bus, that the bus companies have over local communities in terms of you know, what, what routes they're, they're able to uh, run or, or cancel. Um, and that seems unfair, particularly when 35% uh, of journeys come from concessionary travel, which is obviously uh, a major contribution in terms of uh, free bus travel from the, uh, the, the Scottish Government. Um, and that therefore does lead you to the logic of giving more power to local communities and looking to a model that supports uh, municipal bus companies. Um, because ultimately we need to get back to a position where uh, local communities and local councils have greater control over bus routes in order that they can ensure that their bus routes there uh, and bus companies that service the, the local community. Um, one of the other interesting areas around this debate, which I think would, would actually help, might sound a bit technical, but I think it would help, is around ticketing and data. There was a very good briefing provided by the Get Glasgow Moving Group and there's been a lot of discussion over the years about smart ticketing and one ticket, you know, to cover uh, different companies and different modes of transport. And the reality is there's been far too slow movement on that. Uh, I think that would help um, both in terms of ease of travel for customers, but also in terms of collection for data. If we're going to organise the bus routes in an efficient manner that serves customers well, we need more information about fares, more information about routes, and more information about usage. And smart ticketing and the collection of data would help um, service that. Um, the final point I would make uh, is on the workplace uh, parking levy. I think there are two issues with it. Uh, first of all, I mean, it, it is fundamentally unfair. Uh, I've just read a quote from a senior Scottish government minister saying, talking about free prescriptions and saying how it's unfair to tax ill health. Um, but the same token, why, can it be, why is it fair that people are taxed to, to drive to their work? Uh, in some cases, constituents... The member's in his last minute. In fact, he's in his last I, 30 I'm seconds. I'm sorry, I've only, got half, I've only got half a minute. So I think there's a, a fundamental issue with that. And I think the second issue, which even Mr Mason acknowledged, is... This is quite a big change in government policy. 
Um, it's one of the more controversial measures that's been introduced by the SNP over the last 12 years, and it's wrong that it comes in at stage two of a bill. Even if the government you know, genuinely wanted to bring this forward, they should have run a consultation on it, and they should have sought people's views rather than ramming it through as part of a budget deal. So in summing up, there are big issues still to be resolved at stage two, Deputy President Officer. Thank you very much. I call Richard Lyle. Then we move to closing speeches. Mr Thank Lyle. You, Thank you, President Officer. Can I begin by thanking the clerks for their work on the REC uh, Committee report? Start my contribution this afternoon by stating clearly I welcome and support stage one of the transport bill. It's uh, especially important for all to take notice of part one of the bill. Part one of the bill covers low emission zones, an important matter that I feel serves great purpose to this bill. I am concerned of our, regarding our poor air quality in areas which I, that, that is why I want to deliver to the people of Scotland a bill that tends to meet their needs and looks after their health. That's what this bill again anticipates to accomplish. We should make great efforts to improve the health of the people in Scotland by putting forth a bill that strives to reduce air, air pollution. We would do, will do so by pro, uh, prohibiting uh, vehicles who do not meet emission standards from driving in low emission zones. I welcome low emission zones because I sincerely believe that Scotland deserves to live free from health problems caused by poor air quality and we could do so by enforcing low emission zones. We will make this implementation by deliberately planning to prevent any unintended repercussions that would undermine our goal, like suspension of an LEZ. Uh, I believe that a 24 LEZ seven days a week should mean exactly that, as suggested by the British Lung, Lung Foundation. I would like also to note that I believe that our efforts and care should be extended to our local businesses, and that's why I believe that part two of the bill is also essential. Part two of the bill covers bus services in Scotland. This discussion aims to help local councils by giving them options that will help enhance bus services within their area. Part two also strives to be more innovative in the way that bus services could be addressed. And I've, I've always believed as a, as a previous councillor that councils could do more in regard to bus services. Yes, the decline of bus use in Scotland is visible. It's a problem that concerns the committee and it also concerns me. There is a problem that could and should be tackled if Scotland has to reverse this trend. We must address the problem by looking at affordable solutions. I sincerely believe that more of our constituents have the means of approach to our bus services. We would have more people being productive members of, of our society, bestow them with the opportunity to give back to Scotland. Transport Bill is a piece of legislation that does attempt to help Scotland and its people, and it's a start. Moreover, this bill wants to improve the daily life of our, of our citizens by coming up with a solution for our pav pavement parking issue. Indeed, pedestrians must be protected and this bill will ensure that pavement parking will be addressed. We need to restrict pavement parking to pr protect our citizens from harm. Pavement parking is dangerous for all pedestrians, including those with sight loss. In fact, the Guide Dogs Scotland survey, which I thank them for providing this information, found that nine out of ten people with sight loss have had problems with cars parked on the pavement. Obstructions on the pavement are not just an inconvenience, but also a barrier to our people to fully participate in our society. This obstruction prevents people with sight loss to move freely, increases feel feelings of isolation, and affects people with a disability, and also affects buggy users. Transport Bill will make pavement parking an offence, except, of course, on very limited streets exempted by a council. But, presiding officer, this legislation should be that pavement parking should be a total exception, not a norm. I suggest that this should be minimised in line with the ask of the Guide Dog Scotland. This bill responds to the request of our citizens who show that 83 per cent support, a new, uh, support for new legislation to tackle pavement parking. We make bills to improve the lives of all our citizens, including citizens with sight loss, and that's what this section of the bill should be about. As a member, no, I'm sorry, I don't have time. As a member of the committee, I believe we should listen to the views of the Guide Dogs Scotland in regards to loading and unloading. I'm sure that this will be resolved during the next stage, stage with discussion with Guide Dogs Scotland. Finally, I have to raise an issue. As, and I also want to declare an interest as a convener of the cross-party group on showmans, for the Showman's Guild. 
I want to voice my support on giving a limited, limited exemption to showmen. Consideration should be given regarding exemption to show people to get a, through a low emission zone at our stage two of the Transport Scotland Bill. Traditionally, showmen have been acknowledged as a special case and have an exemption in other areas. Historically, I sound like uh, Mr. Stevenson. Historically, show, show people were first granted concessionary rates of taxation in 1927. And the Vehicle Excise and Registration Act 1994 modified the concessions but kept this exemption for the Showman's Guild vehicle. I want to support a preservation of those of that relief for show people during the bill's stage two, and I intend possibly to uh, ensure that happens. President officer, I support this bill, and sure that it aims for great efficiency and pollution control, strives to improve our bus services and to solve our issues regarding pavement parking. And I look forward to the next stage of the bill, where we will be look, uh, looking at uh, workplace parking levy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Closing speeches, I call on Colin Smith to close for Labour. Up to seven minutes, please, Mr Smith. Thank you, President Officer. Transport impacts on many aspects of our constituents' lives, from their health to the environment to poverty. It accounts for more than a third of all greenhouse gas emissions, with levels currently the same as they were in 1990. And it's a key cause of air pollution, which hit illegal levels in eight areas in Scotland last year alone. Cars are by far the biggest polluters in the sector, yet ultra-low emission vehicles still make up less than 1% of road vehicles. Bus usage has plummeted by 20% in the last 10 years under this government, while bus fares have risen by 17% above inflation. The proportion of journeys done on foot has fallen since last year, and just 1.5% of journeys are carried out by bike. And as the Poverty Alliance have highlighted, it's the most disadvantaged who are hit hardest by these changes, such as young people being priced out of travelling to education or work by spiralling bus fares, and older adults and disabled people isolated by the action of local bus services. This transport bill is an opportunity to take these challenges head on, to move towards a modern, green, accessible transport system. It's an opportunity to set up a vision for transport, to establish a legal framework that will underpin our values and ambitions for public transport as a genuine public service. But as this debate has shown, as the bill currently stands, it fails to achieve this. A number of speakers, including Mike Rumbles, John Finney, Peter Chapman, Richard Lyle, and others, talked about low emission zones, albeit with different views. And the bill sets out a much needed and largely reasonable framework for LEZs. But I believe amendments are needed if we are to ensure that the legislation is effective and future-proofed. That means having a, a statutory definition to provide clarity and make clear that the purpose of an LEZ is to ensure air pollution is lower than it would be if an LEZ had not been introduced. Now, that may seem obvious. But when you consider the generous grace periods in the bill and the natural lifespan of cars, there's a real risk of local authorities introducing an LEZ, which ultimately does not have any real effect. And that would be weakened further if they are not operated on a continuous 24-7 basis, as Richard Lell highlighted, or could be suspended. President officer, air pollution costs around 2,500 lives each year in Scotland. It's an urgent public health crisis, with this, which this bill doesn't fully recognise. As Neil Bibby, James Kelly, John Finney, John, John Finney, Mike Rumbles, Jamie Green, I think a number of others also highlighted the bill fails to recognise the urgent crisis we face on our bus network by only allowing councils to run bus services the private sector don't want, something not a single council in Scotland have shown any interest in doing. It's no coincidence that Lothian Buses, Scotland's only municipal bus company, have seen their passenger numbers grow while patronage elsewhere plummets, or that they have a 95% excuse me, customer satisfaction rate in some of the lowest fares in Scotland. This is the outcome of a model which prioritises passengers over profits, a model which encourages social responsibility and crucially delivers millions of pounds a year back into the public purse to be reinvested in public transport. It's simply unsustainable of the government to believe the bill should continue to prevent the rest of Scotland pursuing such a model. A number of members also highlighted the fact is that, as the bill stands, the provisions on ticketing arrangements and schemes also don't go far enough. In fact, they don't even deliver the national multimodal smart card this government promised back in 2012. The establishment of a new national technological standard and the national smart card, smart ticket and advisory board are welcome, but we need to give them that legally binding remit to deliver a single ticketing scheme across Scotland and across transport modes. There was also general consensus from speakers that pavement parking uh, is an inconvenience for disabled people and action is needed to tackle that. 
However, there was also a number of views that said that this should be extended to include a ban on parking on cycle lanes and, and also next to drop curbs, a, a point I think made by Sandra White and Donald Cameron. There was a recognition of the, the need for reasonable and targeted exemptions, however, on the ban on pavement parking. But these must not act as loopholes undermining the ban, and that is what the exemption allowing 20 minutes for delivery and loading does. And I fear allowing a parking on pavements which gave a 1.5 metre space would also act as a loophole and still provide a hazard for those with a visual impairment. This section of the bill also gives councils the power to enforce these new regulations. And it's a point that hasn't been covered so far. So I, I want to spend a couple of, of minutes talking about that. It means that councils without decriminalised parking enforcement will be required to set up an entire department which could issue a parking ticket for a car parked on a pavement on one side of the street, but not issue a ticket for a car parked on a double yellow line at the other side of the street. Now, what an absurd situation for the government to create. And surely it's not beyond their ability to bring forward proposals to either simplify the decriminalisation process or extend enforcement powers to councils for a wider range of traffic offences. Yeah, I'll take an invention here. Jamie Green. Uh, does he share the view of Borders Council who suggested uh, that this simply uh, shifts responsibility and enforcement from police to local authorities when they simply don't have the resource or funding to do so? Colin Smith. I think it's a very valid point that, that Jamie Green makes, that the biggest problem we have is the fallout from the decision by Police Scotland to scrap traffic wardens. They were the ones that enforced um, uh, parking problems in our town centres. And what you actually genuinely see now is police officers walking by cars parked on double yellow lines and not taking that action because it's not seen as a priority by the police. And that, that's leading, in my view, to, to, to parking chaos in far too many of our town centres, which is impacting on businesses in those towns. But the sad reality is, if Police Scotland are not prepared to bring back traffic wardens, then the only way to tackle that is to give that power to local councils in order to en enforce it. But the problem with the bill as it currently stands is if they haven't done that already, if they haven't decriminalised car parking, the council would have to enforce the law on pavement parking, but they don't have the power to enforce the law when it comes to parking on a double yellow line. And that, that really is an absurd position. And simply saying, well, OK, council should go through the huge cost, the huge time to decriminalise parking, in my view, is not fair. And that's an issue and anomaly that the government need to tackle. Now, in the brief time I've got left, President Officer, um, I want to place on record Labour's view that the, the sections on regional transport agencies and in roadworks are welcome, in particular the strengthening of the roadworks commissioner's powers and the provision making the safety code mandatory for road authorities. Finally, President Officer, a number of members did touch on the workplace parking levy, but not one, not a single one, defended the regressive nature of the tax where a company boss paid the same as a company cleaner. The unfairness that my constituents... The members got six or, seconds. Or, or the fact that my constituents in the south of Scotland would have to pay this tax but would have no power on its imposition or have any of that funding spent on public transport. So including presiding officer, Labour will support the principles of the bill today. But as I think all speakers have shown, a lot of work and amendments are needed to make that bill fit for purpose. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I call on Liam Kerr to close the Conservatives up to eight minutes, please. Thank you, presiding officer. I'm uh, very pleased to close this debate uh, at stage one on behalf of the Scottish Conservatives. Let me reiterate at the outset, the bill contains many laudable aims and we will be supporting it at stage one. But as several members have made clear throughout the afternoon, at present, this is something of a missed opportunity. There is little doubt that Scotland's transport network and the framework that governs it is in urgent need of renewal and modernization. What we really need here is a vision a real drive to the future. But as I think has been made clear throughout the afternoon, uh, including in many of the submissions, the very helpful submissions that have been sent in for all of us, significant gaps remain. And for that reason, we certainly are of the view that the bill could go further and we'll be pleased to bring forward amendments at stage two. I'd like to pull out some of the specific areas of the bill and elaborate on the discussion we've heard throughout the afternoon. Firstly, the low emission zones. Uh, there is no doubt that air quality remains an issue for many of our cities, uh, which lowers life expectancy and puts additional pressure on our health service. Indeed, I actually live within a mile of Market Street in Aberdeen, which is one of the most polluted streets in Scotland. The transport sector is the, the largest source of nitrogen oxide emissions and the second largest source of particulates 
in Scotland. And we certainly recognise the many potential benefits of tackling air pollution in Scotland's towns and cities. So we are broadly supportive of LEZs and the effects that they seek to achieve. But there are issues. Now, firstly, I'm indebted to a member of the SNP who I, I shan't name as it wasn't a public conversation, but who pointed out that anecdotally, the impact of the AWPR on market streets pollution may have been considerable. And we're waiting for the local authority to report back on that. And furthermore, she pointed out rightly in my view that market streets issues will be compounded by the many large ships in the adjacent harbour keeping their power running. So we need to be sure with the LEZs that they are used properly and that they will have the desired effect. And I also note the Federation of Small Businesses concerns that the introduction of LEZs could have a direct impact on over 80,000 businesses in Scotland's four cities. And we need to bear in mind that it is a wide definition of businesses. Jamie Green talked about electric powered taxis costing 60,000 pounds, which is a big hit for a self-employed driver. And I also think his point about rural users of diesel or agricultural vehicles is an important one. Yes, of course. John Finney. Thank you, I'm very grateful for the member taking the intervention. Would the member also recognise that increasingly, particularly with vacated shops, that people are living in town and city centres and it would be a boon to them, never mind motorists. Liam, Liam Kerr. Well, I, I would recognise that, but I, I don't think it detracts from my point, which is that LEZs have their place. They can be used properly, but there are some significant concerns that I would like to see ironed out at stage two. Specifically, uh, which I know John Finney will share this concern, the cost to the public purse. Uh, Peter Chapman raised Dundee, which would be one of the cities to bring in an LEZ. Now remember, the point of this is to impose penalties on drivers bringing dirty vehicles into its boundaries. Now, according to a question from Jenny Mara, uh, yesterday at least 100 of the city's buses currently fail to meet basic environmental standards. And the committee flagged that the bus industry has raised concerns that introducing LEZs without sufficient lead-in times could force firms to withdraw services or increase fares, which I know John Finney would be concerned about. That has to be right. And so I absolutely endorse Jamie Green's suggestions that we need proper support and or industry specific exemptions to allow businesses and individuals, particularly vulnerable people, uh, to transition to new LEZs. We need a clear timetable which might need phased implementation. We need new incentives to encourage take up of compliant vehicles and we need support for residents residing within the LEZs and investment to enhance public transport and active travel routes. Then there is pavement parking. Again, I think this is a, a real issue that I'm pleased that the bill addresses. Richard Yule brought up the guide dogs for the blind and having experienced a blindfold walk with a guide dog in Forfar and consulted with constituents in Aberdeen who are mobile only through wheelchairs, there is a definite need in my view to address this. Cars parked on pavements can force people to walk into the road which is especially dangerous for blind and partially sighted people and those with reduced mobility, older people and families with pushchairs. But again, I do share Jamie Green's concerns that whilst inconsiderate parking must be tackled, a blanket ban with no room for exemptions by local authorities, who remember they are the ones that know their communities best, might be too much of a catch-all approach. There has to be room for a compromise to find a balance between protecting vulnerable pedestrians and allowing harmless pavement parking to continue. Now, I do agree with the committee that a limited amount of pavement parking could be permitted in specific areas, provided that a minimum amount of pavement space remains. And just in passing, I hear Edward Mountain talk about Cycling Scotland's brief and whether it would be appropriate to extend the provisions in the bill to cover cycleways. And I hear Sandra White and Donald Cameron, who talked powerfully, in my view, about new protections for dropped curb crossing points. Uh, personally, I think there's a great deal of merit in those proposals and I do endorse the calls for the Scottish Government to consider whether such extensions would be appropriate. Presiding officer, a brief word on the workplace parking levy. I cannot but oppose it. Uh, I cannot see how it can be right to charge workers £500 just to park at their place of work. Of course I will. John Finney. I'm I'm extremely grateful for the member taking intervention at that point. I don't know where he gets that figure from, but would the member acknowledge that his government reviewed the policies that were available to local authorities in England and Wales and considered this was appropriate to be kept? So why does he want fundraising powers for local authorities in England, but not in Scotland? Liam Kerr. 
only one council has done it and the, the, the significant point, John Finney, is we are talking about Scotland, we're talking about what's right for Scotland, yeah. uh, and the number, the sheer number of objections to this, not least, and I know he'll be concerned about this, not least from the Scottish Police Federation, yeah. who suggest it could compromise not only public safety, but the safety of our brave police officers. And I know that will concern John Finney, and we must listen to those voices. And perhaps uniquely, I completely associate myself with Colin Smith's comments in this regard. I think he made absolutely spot on points, as did James Kelly, to be fair, about commuters outside cities paying to no local benefit under a fundamentally inequitable policy. I thought that was well made. Um, and just in passing, Richard Ewell seems to have missed a bit out in his speech. I wonder if he'd like to intervene on me right now and restate his view that he will never vote for this policy. Would you care to do so, Mr. Yu? Lyle. Richard Lyle. I can ask members not to make exchanges across the chamber, but through the chair, and you're concluding in 30 seconds. He seems reluctant to do it, presiding officer, so I won't push the point. I think what's clear from this debate and the committee's report, and indeed the many submissions which various groups have sent in advance of this debate, the bill is laudable. There are many good principles here, including a focus on the environment and supporting bus services, which I've not had time to summarise, but I thought Mike Rumbles and Peter Chapman looked at in detail and very persuasively. Whether it goes far enough or is ambitious enough, I have my doubts, but I confirm we'll support the principles at stage one, and I look forward to cross-party collaborative working going forward to drive improvements into Scotland's transport network. Thank you very much, and I call on Michael Matheson to wind up the debate for the Government Cabinet Secretary till decision time, please. Thank you, uh, President Officer. Now, I welcome the contributions from right across the Chamber in touching upon a whole range of different issues within this. Uh, Bill Edward Mountain, in his uh, opening comments, uh, made reference to the time allocation for this bill, given the complexity of it and the range of issues which it does cover. And I do have some sympathy uh, with that, given the uh, range of topics which are covered. Even my opening remarks, I was having to canter through them in order to try and touch upon as many of them as uh, possible. However, I will um, seek to try and pick up on some of the issues which have been raised. I do take uh, exception to the suggestion from Mr Green, though, in some way this is not an ambitious uh, bill, which I, I think is uh, what you call it, because uh, I think he's got himself confused between the need for legislation and the need for a strategy in taking forward provisions that are created within uh, legislation. Uh, and that's why I say at the outset in my speech is that uh, the bill is only one element of the wider range of measures that we need to take forward on tackling a whole range of different transport issues and why the review of the national transport strategy will be absolutely critical to making sure we achieve the benefits that can come from this bill but achieve that much more ambitious agenda of improving Scotland's transport infrastructure and transport services and I'm sure he will wait with bated breath to read the draft of the National Transport Strategy when it's published and he'll share it with Mr Kerr beside him who seems to have confused legislation and strategy as well. However, I want to pick up on one of the key issues that was raised in the course of the debate and that was the provision of low emission uh, zones. Uh, it's clear that um, uh, there, is a, there is a need for us to make sure we're taking appropriate action to address issues of uh, pollution air quality within our town centres and particularly within our big city town centres and low emission zones are a very clear element that can assist us in seeking to achieve that. Uh, Edward Mountain, Jamie Green, Mike Rumbles, John Finney, uh, Colin Smith uh, amongst others raised the very issue of low emission zones in their own contributions. And one of the issues which was being raised in particular was the issue of the standardised approach that there will be to low emission zones and if members want to reflect upon uh, both my evidence to the REC committee which was correctly reflected by Mr Mountain and also in my response to the stage one report is that our intention is to have consistency on how low emission zones are applied so that the truck that is compliant or the bus that is compliant, the car that's compliant in Glasgow low emission zone will also be compliant with the low emission zone in Dundee in Aberdeen or in Edinburgh. So there is a consistent approach to the standards which will be applied. And the very reason, I will do, but and the very reason that we are setting out, the the setting out these provisions within regulations is to allow us to have the flexibility to adapt those as things progress. So as we get more advanced on 
uh, the Euro 6 engines or the uh, Euro Class 4 uh, engines, we are in a position where we can adapt that, where technology adapts, that we're able to adapt the regulations. Rather than reverting back to primary legislation, we can do it much more quickly and flexibly through regulations as we learn how they are bedding in and also as technology progresses. I'll give way to Mr Stevenson. Stuart Stevenson. Uh, th thank you very much. Uh, looking at the clean air area for Scotland, the road to a healthier future, which uh, the government published, the second pollutant on the list provided there is sulphur dioxide. Um, the issue of uh, vessels continuing to run their engines in harbours adjacent to areas is a real one because that's the big source of sulphur dioxide. Will the Cabinet Secretary work with the UK government to try and reduce the sulphur in marine fuels, which might help? Cabinet Secretary. The, officer, the member makes a, a good point because there, is a, uh, there are new and emerging technologies within the marine industry in itself uh, which uh, could help to address this, and that's something which we'll continue to pursue with the UK government to try and seek to address that uh, very issue. Uh, but in the issue of uh, air quality, something that was raised by Peter Chapman and his contribution, also by uh, John Finney, the low emission zones do not sit on their own in seeking to improve air quality within our city centres. Uh, a key part of uh, what we're seeking to do with the uh, low emission zones is to help to take forward a range of other measures that can help to prioritise public transport options. We only have to look at the approach that's been taken by Glasgow City Council. Uh, who introduced the first of our low emission zone on 31st of uh, December in Hugmanay of last year with the Glasgow Connectivity Commission, which is looking at a whole range of different issues and how they can improve transport connectivity within the Glasgow and in the greater Glasgow area, a key part of which is to look at improving bus provision uh, within that particular area. So the approach that has been taken by a city like Glasgow is exactly the approach that low emission zones are about helping to support and achieve that wider, more holistic approach of looking at active travel options, looking at other public, uh, public transport options, looking at bus prioritisation, all of the measures which we know can assist us in helping to improve air quality in our town centres and also have improved the attractiveness of public transport options and also active transport options uh, in taking uh, forward these uh, measures. And that's why, for example, in places like Glasgow, where the average speed of a, a bus going through the city centre, I'm told, is in the region of three miles per hour. So by looking at providing greater public transport prioritisation uh, within the town centre, uh, if they double that to six miles an hour, it makes journey times actually quicker, it makes public transport and bus more attractive, and actually the cost base for the industry in running those buses is lower as well. And that's one of the measures that they're considering and looking at how they can take that forward. Can I say, uh, President Officer, that low emission zones are going to be an important element, but they are one of a range of issues. Now, President Officer, a number of members have raised issues in relating, relation to the bus industry, in particular the issue of uh, declining patronage. I think one of, the, one of the errors that can be made in tackling some of the challenges we have around the bus industry is to think there is some magic wand to reverse over four decades of decline in bus patronage. We all know that the reasons for the decline in bus patronage are multifactorial. There are a whole range of different issues that impact on uh, bus patronage. The idea that there is some simple one-off solution off the shelf that will address all of these issues is simply wrong because of the complexity of uh, the issue. And that's why it's important in the provisions that we have made available within this bill is that we provide a range of different options which are available to local authorities in order to look at developing an approach that best suits their local circumstances. Now, for some, that may be franchising. For some, it may be a bus service improvement partnership. For some, it may be running their own services. And I hear the views, as I said when I was at committee, those who believe that there should be the provision where local authorities should be able to run their own services as and when they like on a municipal basis like we have here in Wodin uh, as well. I, uh, I'm, uh, I'm not ideologically opposed to that. However, one note of caution is the suggestion that that is the answer to all of our bus issues in Scotland is simply not true. And the reason I would say that is because you only have to look at some of the municipal bus services in England, in some cities, where they do not work well at all. And they are looking to disinvest from them because of the challenges they've got. So it's not simply about one model, it's about how you make the use of that model, which is important and which is why we'll give consideration to it. 
the, I think Mr Smith was first in seeking to try and make an intervention. I'll give way to him. Colin Smith. I, I think what was important during the debate, not a single member said that, that there was one panacea, if you like, for, for, for the decline in bus uh, patronage. But why does the Cabinet Secretary think banning councils from having the same model yeah. in Lothian is a way to actually improve bus services? Why does he stick to that point? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, officer, as I've said, and I will repeat for the third time for the member, I'm open to giving consideration to that particular option. However, I think when members uh, overplay a particular option, it suggests to me they do think there is a simple wand that they can wave that will resolve problems, which is simply just not true and doesn't reflect the complexity of the issue. And no doubt the member will want to reflect upon that. On issue, President Officer, and drawing my remarks to a close around parking, um, I, I, I hear the competing views that have been across the chamber about the 20 minute exemption to allow people to do unloading is important to recognise that. Those in the road haulage industry, within uh, those who are in delivery industries and business would say there needs to be some level of exemption to allow deliveries to take place. To those who think there should be no exemption uh, whatsoever, or it should be on the basis, not time, but it should be on the basis of the, the, the level pathway that could be made available to the concerns which have been raised by Sandra uh, White, who I think everyone in the chamber would want to recognise, along with uh, Ross Finney and Joe Fitzpatrick, over many years have been pursuing the whole issue of uh, pavement parking and the need to tackle that issue effectively. I will, of course, President Officer, reflect on the views and the issues which have been raised by the committee in this matter and by members in the chamber. We are seeking to achieve a balance that addresses this issue in an appropriate fashion. But of course, if there are ways in which we can address some of the concerns which have been raised, we will certainly give them due consideration in a stage two process. Thank you very much. And that concludes this afternoon's debate. The next item is consideration of motion 16393 on a financial resolution for the Transport Scotland Bill. And could I call on Derek Mackay to move the motion? Moved. Thank you very much. And the question will be put at decision time, to which we now turn. Uh, there are just two questions. The first question is that motion 16747, in the name of Michael Matheson, on stage one of the Transport Scotland Bill, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And the next question, the final question, is that motion 16393, in the name of Derek Mackay, on a financial resolution for the Transport Scotland Bill, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And that concludes decision time. I just remind members that I will be in touch at some point over the next week, but have a productive recess. And I close this meeting. <laughs>